Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Earrings Off. We want to invite you to subscribe, rate, and leave us a review. You can find us on Facebook at Earrings Off Podcast and on Instagram at The Earrings Off Podcast. Welcome to Earrings Off. I'm Lou. And I'm Teresa. Let's get started. Well, good morning. Teresa and I are very excited. We have with us today a special guest, Dolores McQuinn, who was elected on January 6, 2009 to the Virginia House of Delegates, representing the 70th District, which is made up of parts of Chesterfield and Henrico counties and the city of Richmond. She was previously a member of Richmond City Council and truth be told, one of my bosses. <laughs> I look up to her very much and I, I so admire the work that she's done because Delegate McQuinn is a true champion of equality and she has done so much to highlight food desert issues and solutions, including sponsoring a bill <clears throat> to provide relief to neighborhoods which lack sufficient food options. Lou, I'd like to add another thing about Delegate McQuinn. She's worked mightily to ensure that the true story of Virginia's role in the slave trade is correctly portrayed. Also joining us today, we have Chelsea Bennett. Chelsea's the Virginia Government Relations Director of the American Heart Association. Chelsea is also the co-chair of the Virginia Food Access Coalition and has lent her considerable experience, skills, and voice to address this important issue. So again, thank you so much to Delegate McQuinn and, and um, Chelsea for being with us today. We, this is an important issue for our community and at Earrings Off, we're all about trying to educate the community, empower the community so that we stay abreast of issues that impact us so that we can have a voice and do what we need to do as citizens to try to help um, improve our neighborhoods, our communities, and of course, the quality of our lives. So again, thank you both so much for taking time out of your schedules to speak with us today. We're going to jump right in. Um, if you can tell us then, what exactly, when you say food deserts, what, what are we talking about? Thank you, Lou and Teresa, for this opportunity to be with you on Ear Rain Paul. I'm so impressed with what you all are doing and thank you for empowering our communities to understand, to comprehend, and to be engaged. So I do appreciate that. And I want to say especially, and thanks to Lou, my good friend, and Teresa, you're my friend now because I just <laughs> met you today. <laughs> but um, you, you're asking the question, for what are food deserts? And I want to, first of all, just to launch my, I guess, my response with that from this perspective. In Churchill, which I represented for many, many years, the Churchill of today did not look like the Churchill of yesterday, where there were, you know, blight and, uh, you know, dilapidated homes, the largest uh, percentage of individuals who, I guess, dealt with uh, preventable disease such as obesity, high blood pressure, you know, hypertension, all of those things that we need to be addressing in our lives to be healthy. But there was also one other thing that often occurred, and that was the lack of resources in the community. Probably one of the most oppressed uh, community in the city of Richmond, where about 25% of the region poor lived in that district, in the 7th district. Mm -hmm. And I had the opportunity to represent them and to understand some of the dynamics of the time. But there was a, a, a little fella who I would never, ever forget who would come knocking on my door. I mean, it was, it was two or three times a week really? uh, looking for food for himself and his sibling. And I had, and, and I'm sure something else was going on in the home, mm -hmm. but, but just the fact that he would often come to my house asking for food that stuck with me forever. It became a very much a part of, of, uh, of, of any of my decisions as it relates to 
uh, helping to address the issues of food desert and food insecurity. Because I, certainly I, I thought to myself, why in one of the richest nation in, in the world, as well as agriculturally, you know, in Virginia, what we have and what we had the capacity to do, why are there individuals who are hungry and especially children? Right. So getting to food deserts. Food deserts are areas or communities that are limited, have limited resources, financial, economic resources or access to quality and affordable food. I mean, we want, if they're gonna have food, we want to make certain that those foods to be nutritious, but these are communities that don't have that. And, and they are commonly known, these particular areas, uh, Churchill would have been a food desert. We had many convenience stores, matter of fact, convenience stores overload in the community. But in terms of having a, a quality supermarket or grocery store that was out of the question. And it wasn't because we didn't try to get one in there. It was because of those familiar and well-known collaborates in terms of grocery store, a place like Churchill, they had no intentions of coming into. Wow. And so, but that's what mm -hmm. food deserts are, you know, and, and many of them are in places where the social determinants are a big issue. And I'm going to let, you know, turn it over and, and, and uh, so Chelsea can also uh, sure. speak to that issue. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Delegate, you, you, you hit all the points. I think it's so important, the Churchill example, but to know throughout uh, Virginia, there are food deserts. And uh, I'm the policy nerd, so I'll share with everyone that according to the USDA in urban areas, it's one mile without that grocery store. And if you're in a rural area, it is that 10 mile radius. And so as the delegate was saying, you know, too often in low income areas, we are bombarded with options that are unhealthy. I mean, that's the best way to say it. They're unhealthy options. Um, and there's a lack of information and knowledge about the importance uh, sometimes of the food, of why we need the nutritious food. But before we can even get to education, we have to have access. And so that's exactly what the delegate did, has been doing for over a year, 11 years, and what she was able to successfully get across the finish line this year with the Virginia Food Access Investment Program and Fund is to it's the first step of many steps, as she often says, one tool in our toolbox to increase access, you know, because for us to be able to have and eat delicious, nutritious food, because healthy food, as we talk about all the time at the Heart Association, can be delicious, you first have to have access. So we want to ensure that those fresh fruits and vegetables are in these communities that have been designated um, due to their census track as food deserts. Yeah, Lou and, and Teresa, the other thing that I think is important too, and that's why it is essential, imperative that government would get involved and begin to look at these places, the policies, uh, you know, we would address it from the perspective of policy and resources, because these are often the red line community, okay? And so um, all the dynamics yeah. that happen Many, many years ago, when there was a lack right. of investment or no investment, the, 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 the chicken is coming home to roost now. Right. And, and, mm -hmm. and the COVID-19 exacerbated this. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was the covers were pulled off of every mm -hmm. uh, uh, discriminatory practice that had happened over the years that many of us have talked about, right. but was unable to break through in terms of helping people to understand the, the, the aftermath, how, what, what the consequences were. Right. And um, it, it, it is in our face now. Right, right. Most definitely. Right. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And yeah. I tell you, when we talk about the food deserts and what the picture you painted so clearly about what that means reminds me of, you know, when I was younger and I'd go to DC to see my aunt who lived in the inner city, there was not a grocery store anywhere. And I would have to go to the corner store to get her groceries, which they cost a lot. The selections were very, very limited. I don't remember seeing any fresh things in there, but that 
because she didn't drive or uh, her own yes. mode of transportation was public, you know, the, the bus, that's where she went most of the time. And that's where she would send me, Lou, go get me this. Or, and that's where I would walk to get her stuff and carry it back. But there were just not grocery stores around her area. And now when I go to D.C. and I look at where she lives, and of course, it's changed now. Yes. And so then when the changes occur, that's when you start seeing more of an investment in those neighborhoods. And that's been done for years and it's so intentional. But it's interesting because um, when we did a feasibility study in Churchill, trying to bring a grocery store to Churchill, when we found out $13.9 million yearly was going out of that community with a within a seven mile radius yeah. into either Henrico County and most often it was Henrico. Yeah. So the money was being spent. That's right. Okay. We they just it just was not coming back right. into the city of Richmond Coffer. Delegate, could you talk a little bit about food insecurity as it relates to the food desert? Yeah, and when when we t- and they are so intertwined because yeah. I mean, it, it really has something to do with, you know, um, I mean, creating an environment where people have access, where people have affordable, where there is nutritious, and then having the resources to be able to secure what they need. Um, mm-hmm. It is, I mean, it, it is almost, you know, just using this analogy, do I go to the, gro- do I go to the grocery store and buy food? Or do I spend this me- money on medicine? Yeah. You know, particularly right. for our elderly population who often are dealing with those kind of, well, well feel like they don't have any options. And so it, it is really about, you know, um, it may not necessarily, as I heard someone say, cause hunger, but hunger is the outcome possibly of food insecurity. Right. And so it is, you know, I, I think that the, the fact that an elderly population and certainly our children right. uh, in this scenario are often um, affected the most. I mean, education wise, with our kids going to school, Agreed. not having food and uh, and not having, you know, again, uh, eating breakfast. And then we are expect the expectation is that they're going to be in a setting where they can learn. Right. I mean, and so that's it's basically not having the resources to secure what you need in terms of having a healthy lifestyle. Uh, you yeah. Know. yeah, right, right. According to the Virginia Food Access Coalition, 1.7 million Virginians, including 480,000 children, delegate to go to your earlier point, they live in low-income neighborhoods where grocery stores are few and far between. So can you talk a little bit about specifically about your legislation, House Bill 1509, which, which addresses providing relief to the food insecure neighborhoods? I think Chelsea hit on that a little bit earlier about the specifics of the legislation. But can you just, um, as the minister say, make it plain for us? <laughs> <laughs> And I wanted to make sure that we, you know, talk about that this has been, uh, and I think Chelsea may have said some 11 years, you know, trying to get to this point. Wow. Uh, 11 years. 11 years. And and the first year when I put in a bill talking about food deserts, I want to remember one of my colleagues, and again, this was lack of knowledge, saying to me, what is food desserts? I mean. Oh, oh my goodness. Really? but. But it was limited understanding and knowledge of what it meant. What was food deserts and and why is this so important? But this bill, and and I I probably should just let Chelsea talk about it because she loved talking about this bill. But (laughs) I would would hit up on a few things and then I'll turn it over to Chelsea. But the Virginia Food Access Investment Program and Fund really was um, developed again in terms of helping to find those individuals or entities who are looking at providing certain, um, I guess, uh, creating or eliminating food deserts and food insecurity. So they're already out there working. Uh, there are those who are interested in doing, doing that. And we were able to secure $1.2 million uh, in the budget so that we can begin to find you know, the funding, 
hopefully matching funds. We could, you know, the grocery stores, we can begin to look at those places and see, can we help support them so that they could go to various communities. Those that um, had innovative uh, uh, projects that they wanted to like churches that had the feeding program. And mm -hmm. now many of them have gardens, you know, mm -hmm. how do we take these funds and help support what they are doing so that and invest in their community and economically there'll be those who will benefit as we uh, provide these resources for the community. So Chelsea, I'm gonna turn it over to you and mm -hmm. then we'll go, we'll take it from there. Okay. Yeah. Yes, two major pieces to the Virginia Food Access Investment Program and Fund. And so the first piece, as we were just hearing from Delegate McQuinn, is to, um, and the, the purpose of the bill overall is to improve access. But the first piece is really looking at it from a food enterprise perspective to be able to invest in new or currently existing uh, retailers that are looking to go into these food deserts um, and be a part of the solution. That has been the delegate's uh, perspective, again, for 11 years is what is the solution or what are the solutions? Because we know that there are multiple solutions to food deserts and food insecurity. Um, and so, you know, there, the grant is actually in the process of being developed, and we are hoping that it will be open for proposals either at the end of the year or beginning of the year and applicants will have about four months to put their proposal together to be able to submit it to the Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. There's a second part of the bill that you know here at the Heart Association we were so grateful for the delegate support and that's the SNAP piece. We are very intentional and focused on increasing the number of retailers that accept SNAP and also accept the one-to-one -one match program that we have here in Virginia. And the reason why that is so important is because when we think about it, when we're looking at many of these low-income areas, many of the individuals um, are able to apply for and receive SNAP. And so we want to make sure that, you know, when that choice is between medicine, their prescription, and food, that they'll be able to get both because there's retailers that accepted the SNAP program, um, supplement and nutrition assistance program, but there's mm -hmm. also retailers that accept the one-to-one -one match. And so what does that mean? That means that if they go in and they want to pick up a, a apple for a dollar, not saying that an apple should mm -hmm. be a dollar, right. <laughs> right. but they'll be able to get a second apple for that same dollar, literally one-to-one -one in terms of what it looks like. And so it was really important again for the delegate to make sure that we're investing in the community, which we'll be able to do through these grants, but that the recipients also are increasing access to the communities that they're serving and that they're able to get the best bang for their, their buck. And okay, that, mm -hmm. that's good. And now, so Chelsea, you're saying that under SNAP then, that that's gonna be a component to make sure the SNAP recipients, okay, because you know, um, I'm on the Virginia Board of Social Services, so that's something I can look out for and ask questions about to sort of track, okay, what are we doing with that? So mm -hmm. that, that's good information to have. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, that is no, very, us, very good information. Yeah. We may be tapping so, something else, Lou. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> please, please, because yeah. um, I tell you, you know, you have to, um, you have to be careful. You don't, you don't want to sound racist, but this is why it's so important to have, um, you know, African-Americans in positions of power, politicians, yes. because yes. many yes. times people aren't, it's just they don't know. When you yes. have to explain to your colleagues what, what's happening in our neighborhoods, in our culture, if but for, by the grace of God, that someone is there that yes. cares and understands, these issues wouldn't be brought to the forefront front many times right. it's been intentional but sometimes it's just people don't know there's mm -hmm. an educational piece that's lacking so um kudos to both of you particularly to delegate uh, mcquinn for all of her hard work on this so thank you yeah thank you for your dedication delegate yeah. <laughs> we're here today uh, yeah, yeah for yeah. sure yeah. You never gave for up sure yeah so. right um 11 years in the making yeah that's kudos for sure so we talked about the government responsibility and and, we, and and the fact that now we have this this house bill that has been passed in the, the two part approach to food deserts. But what about individuals? How can individuals help? 
You know, I think one of the bigger things that all of us need to do, and that is to familiarize ourselves, and Lou just sort of spoke to that, about what's going on. I mean, what, what is going on? How do we get people more engaged? Uh, we used to say in the, in, the, uh, in the church, each one reach one. I mean, we mm -hmm. are, you know, all of us know someone that would find themselves and basically in this situation in the black community. Yeah. So, what, what, you know, how do we create directions or, or pathway so that people would be able to understand, first of all, that we are dealing with a real issue and so many people yeah. are dealing with it. And, and, and what can they do to help? Well, familiarize yourself with what's going on and then begin to tap into or connect with organizations that are doing the work. You can always volunteer. You can always make uh, recommendations to someone about who is doing the work that, you know, you know, this family that's in need. But I think, you know, education, becoming knowledgeable about a very a real situation. I mean, we, we are trying to, I guess, change the structure. We are, we are trying to restructure uh, what, has, what exists so that there's a fairer and more equitable opportunity for everyone, whether it is economically, you know, creating the enterprise so that there are people we can hire, we can find jobs for, or whether it is just making sure that there are no little individuals who was in, like was in my community, would have to knock on your door and say, I need food. Right. Right. It really mm -hmm. is the bigger picture and how do all of us become engaged. And I, I tell people when they say, I'm bored, there's no reason for you to be bored under any circumstances with yeah. all of the needs that are out there. And now, even more so, um, since COVID-19, I mean, the line mm -hmm. that yeah. exists for people getting food and trying right. to make those ends meet. Yeah. So you can create right. organization, but you can also and get, get in and do some work. Yeah. yeah. Right. Okay. Very good. That, that is so true because I, I have to tell you, I, my sister in, in her neighborhood, she talked about how since COVID has hit, she said it just touched her, the line, the food bank lines. And we're seeing it, you know, where there are just people in cars for, you know, yes. blocks and blocks waiting hours to get food. And you are so right, Delegate. This COVID-19 has just pulled the covers off of what we already knew was there. We've always been trying to navigate through it all yes. our lives. So we were very aware of what was going on. But now no one can hide from the reality of what's happening um, in, this, in this nation. So, yeah. It's in, pl it's in plain sight. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Right. Right. Yeah. You don't have the luxury of being bored or burying our heads in the sand and saying, you know what, I'm okay. And no, that's not, that's not okay. Well, it will, it will get, it will, they will be more engaged government and everyone, because guess what? It is not just a certain demographic that's being affected now. Okay. Right. And, and as, as always, you know, I, I say about the substance abuse issue, you know, we have had to deal with it forever. But now, you know, there is a, another demographic that's very engaged. So oh, often yeah. It, yeah. you, it has to knock on your door. Yeah. Uh, hunger has to knock on the door <laughs> before right. yeah. you know, everyone gets involved. That's yeah. right. That's right. right. Mm -hmm. so, but um, when you talked about what you saw in Church Hill, so what, how does that, the food desert issue, what impact does it have on the community at large? What are you seeing in terms of how that's impacting community members just not having access to the food? Statistics will, will tell us and show us that yeah. it, play, it has a negative impact on your health, uh, whether it is um, on your bank account, um, it, it, it doesn't matter. It just plays a, whether it's education mm -hmm. on you. And, and many of the things that w when it comes to areas like, uh, existed in Churchill, you know, we had so those that affected you. I mean, so if you're in a food desert, then more than likely there are some public safety issues. 
We know that the public safety, I mean, the public health issues exist in terms of uh, public safety. You don't have anywhere to walk. You don't have anywhere to do exercise because for fear of what may be going on in the community, public health is obesity, mm -hmm. diabetes, yeah. you know, high blood pressure, hypertension. I mean, you, you name it, you know, the kidney uh, functioning or, or not. All of those things usually exist in more poverty-stricken community, more red line community, more communities where there are food deserts and the greater part of food insecurity. Mm -hmm. So when, when, how does it affect you? I mean, and, it, it, and, and it's costly. It's a costly, yeah. um, I guess, uh, deficit that, that, that people, you know, when you begin to look at it, I mean, just like diabetes, you know, many of these folks would not have the resources to get their medicine. Yeah. And so somebody's going to have to take care of it. That's right. You know, by That's law. Right. That's you right. Know? Um, so it can, I always say you can, you know, pay now or you pay later, mm -hmm. but eventually you will pay. Mm -hmm. and, and again, you know, we are, society is mm -hmm. paying for many of these things that have been uh, structurally discriminatory. And now we're at a point that we'll say, you know, no longer, we, we're mm -hmm. just not going to sit on the sideline and mm -hmm. watch this happen. Right, right. Well, and certainly, like I said, going back to my aunt's example, the example about my aunt, because she was um, a retired hairstylist on a fixed income, and that was the only neighborhood store. Mm -hmm. Of course, the, ha the prices were high. And yes. so, it, you know, you do, you're trying to manage all of that, deal with your medication and your other expenses, and this is the only option you have. So um, I, this is... Um, definitely an important topic and one I certainly understand because of her, the challenges that she faced in dealing with that. Yeah. yeah. And then just another point as we talk about food access and the impact on the community is with cardiovascular disease. Annually, yeah. over 50,000 Black women lose their lives to cardiovascular disease. Yeah. Wow. And, and then yeah. of African American yeah. women ages 20 and older 49% have heart diseases. And so when we're talking about the health impacts, we're talking about the social determinants of health, as you've heard from the delegate, this is all around, but just to think this one disease, she mentioned diabetes and other things, but heart disease, how it's affecting black women is, is, is a key as well of why this is so important. Right. And so when they're talking about, and you're constantly hearing on the news about COVID-19 and we're at risk. Yeah. Yeah. Because there's been yeah. a lack of access, you know, that that's the reality. So. And, yeah. and, and, and the other thing too, that we didn't talk about, and I'm, I'm talking about because my daughter is at that age, uh, but, but a pregnant women. Mm -hmm. having the, yeah. the you know, yeah. access to nutritious food right. Right. Is, is one of the most important things that they could do in terms of helping to take care of themselves so mm -hmm. that children that are born are healthy. Right. Uh, it is, it is um, you know, and so it, all around, you know, the impact and the insecurity and the shortage and, and the economic piece just play uh, you know, just poor nutrition period plays a major role in uh, just creating healthy communities. Well, and you know what, Delga, that's so true because when you just shared about the, um, when you just shared about the pregnant women and the impact of that, that made me think about how we've always been told that, okay, you grew up in a household where they're cooking the fat back and they're cooking... Mm -hmm. This is what we learn. But if this yes. is all we have access to, then even when you yes. your style may change and you, you that's still a part of you because those are the foods that you grew up with. Those are the concepts. Yes. So then we're showing this next generation these bad eating habits, but that's that's what was available. So it it all of that is causing a tremendous impact on our health general like you know throughout the generation so yeah yeah yeah, yeah. health care is costly yeah. and and someone yeah. you know somebody's got to take care of it. when there is a individual and you show up at the hospital the indigent will be taken care of and and that is you know that's by law 
Yeah. So again, these are some issues that, I mean, personally, in, as it relates to food deserts and food insecurity, this is a, this is a challenge that we can work out. This is something that it is, it is not the way, it's the wheel. You know what I'm saying with this? Right, right. If we have the will to do it, not the way we do it, if we have the will to resolve this particular issue. So what you're saying about the, the indigent going to the hospital and being taken care of, I mean, that's a, that's a human right, right? Yes. So yes. We, we expect that to happen. But yes. why is it such a, why is food not considered that same basic human right? And, and it should be. But again, when it is not considered until it knocks on your door, I mean, when, it, when it's knocking at your door, when it's knocking at you, in your community, then it becomes a human right. Mm -hmm. and, and for the most part, part what is it, out of, a, out of sight, mm -hmm. out of mind, mm -hmm. yeah. how many of these uh, uh, communities that have, don't have access or poverty, stricken communities, the disadvantaged, the marginalized, this is the way it's been treated over the years. I right. mean, it's, it, we don't see you. We, we basically put you in a corner. We don't have to drive through. We don't have to come through. We don't have to be a part. We don't even really need to. It's nothing that says we have to know what's going on. And that's what has happened in the past. Mm -hmm. And, um, and mm -hmm. so I, I, I just think that, yeah, it is a basic human right. Yeah. Uh, that that we make certain that people are fed and they are not hungry, that they have access. Yeah. Um, yeah. And um, I, again, I believe we are trying to move in that direction just through uh, uh, information, more acknowledgement of what's going on. Uh, more people are caring. There's a change. There's a shifting going on. Okay. Where people are saying, we would not sit on the sideline any longer. That's good stuff. But Delegate McQueen, what in Chelsea, what part then do you think fast food restaurants play in this <laughs> in the food desert issue? To be quite honest, many of them are have contributed to the issue mm -hmm. because when you have dollar menus that are filled with foods that many times we don't even really know everything that's contained in them. Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, there it's tons of carbs, it's fats, it's loaded with salt uh, and sodium, all these things that lend to hypertension, high blood pressure, then gets back to cardiovascular disease, increases your chances of stroke. Um, they have contributed. And when you think about, I think about, even though I was born in Florida, I think about where I was raised and it was a food desert. It was easy to get to the convenience store. It was easy to get to McDonald's, Wendy's, and many of the other fast food places and order off the dollar menu. You know, many times, many evenings for me, it was what were the two items I was ordering off the dollar menu because that's what was in our budget. And so when we think about the well-being of our community, it is they have come into these areas. They continue to be in low income areas because this is where they know that they are able to make profit. Um, and so I will say that it has been encouraging to see many um, fast food restaurants begin to invest yes. and offer more healthier options. Yes. Yeah. Um, but we're still where we, we're not where we need to be. And so it's important to call out the fast food restaurants and know that for many of our neighborhoods, they have been a part of the issue. But we also have to admit and be real that they're not the total part of they're not the total issue right. they're just a part of it and again i think that the piece of legislation from the delegate is one of those um pieces that's going to help push us push the fast food restaurants out or at least allow for people to have more understanding of why they should have these fresh fruits and vegetables and for them to see people in their community selling to them fresh fruits and vegetables i mean that's a big part of her legislation is that community wealth building to be able to empower communities community folks to be able to sell fresh fruits and vegetables to their community. And so again, fast foods restaurants have been a part of the issue, but this piece of legislation is going to be one that's going to help us build that community wealth um, to take back our health. Okay. Okay. Very good. Very good. Wow.
So I, I'd like to um to ask you another follow up question on that one, Chelsea. So we talked about the fact that in the past we've only eaten those foods that are bad for us. And Lou used the example of the fat bath or, you know, just the bad food. So now we're looking at this house bill that's going to bring alternatives, right? Yes. Um, and grocery stores and fresh foods. And what about the education piece? Because yes, if all we've yes, known yes. is the bad, mm -hmm. is the bad food, now we have these options. How are we going to educate the folks to say now, Look what you, you have these good choices and how to use those good choices to, to choose a fresh vegetable over, over a dollar menu item. Does the house bill address that at all? And how do we, yes. how do we, how do we make the community healthy? Yes, uh, thank you for the follow-up question. It does. Uh, because of the delegates' years of experience in legislation, in legislating, one of the components of the bill was uh, for a full-time employee over the next two years at the Virginia Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services. And so that individual is going to be responsible for the execution of this new wow. grant program, yeah. as well mm -hmm. as as part of their job description, which I want to just throw in a plug that there will be a food access coordinator at VDAX. Um, and that position description will be uh, released in the next few weeks. And so, you know, if there are individuals who want to serve at that state level and be a part of something brand new, be yeah. sure to stay in contact with the delegate and I, and we can be sure you get that link. Yeah. Um, but in this position, part of what they're responsible for is education, but mm -hmm. also connecting the dots. Because to your point, Teresa, there are many organizations out there that have a role in the food access cycle, the food access system, but many of them across the state and even in Richmond, they're not always connected. And so this person is going mm -hmm. to help with education, but they're also going to be a connector because to your point, one of the, another thing, um, I'm, I'm, I will always sing the delegates praises because of this tremendous bill that we have before us is understanding that government has a role in this, as we talked about a little earlier, but government mm -hmm. does not have the solo role. And right. so if we're right. looking at all of the different pieces that will help our communities be healthier, you know, have more wealth, um, have better education systems, you know, food mm -hmm. is a part of that. And so that mm -hmm. position will help with that. And again, in the coming weeks, that position will be open for applications. And so if someone's interested in being that connector helping with education but most importantly executing these grants that will be provided to retailers they should apply wow that is we awesome have a, we have an opportunity to sort of lead another generation into taking care of themselves better wow. as lou had mm -hmm. talked about mm -hmm. how we uh you know it was only we ate what was available you know, and I right. tell I tell young people, and I've got a group of them now, who are out in their yards planting, okay? Actually, you know, planting tomatoes and peppers and, and those kind of things. We've got a, we have, we have, I think, uh, and the entire community, just right, Chelsea, not just government, but the faith community, you know, those mm, nonprofits yeah. that are serving in that community to begin to talk and speak about this issue of food uh, insecurity and food deserts in terms of how to eliminate. What can we do ourselves? And then uh, as an individual, what is it that I can do to be responsible for my health, for my family, uh, for good health for my family? What are those responsibilities? And then let's extend it to the community, the churches, this is something they should be talking about in Sunday school. I'm sorry. Right. Yeah. In the pulpit. Yeah. Right. And you name it. We can get it done. Again, just taking, you know, self. I mean, it's just being responsible ourselves right. as a community. Well, right. I tell you, um, if, if we weren't doing a, if I, if Teresa and I actually had a budget instead of a cheap podcast, that's where you'd hear me drop the mic on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Having that, I'm serious because you can craft legislation, but if you don't have someone who's going to actually be there to do the work and to execute and to connect, 
it's like it's very hard to see success with that. So um, I, I just applaud you for, for being such a forward thinker, both of you, to uh, include that piece in it. And um, I, I tell you, and I'm sitting here, you know, you, you everybody has a role that I just don't, I don't even think I have it in me to fight for something for that long a period of time. So again, right. to you for, for being relentless in that. We have, um, through our talk today, we've covered much of the points that we have, but I do want to um, cover this um, this additional point. So what, what criteria then, Delia, when you talked about there was money going out of, you know, your district, going into other counties even. So when we know that people have to eat and we know that, particularly in low-income families, that it's more important than ever that, that we have access to fresh foods, that we, we are concerned about the money, our, our income is limited, is forcing us to make choices um, with regard to medicine, housing, transportation, because we, we have to feed our families. And, and I can't even imagine as a parent looking into the eyes of my child mm -hmm. and my child being hungry. That, that does something to you emotionally. That's oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. On families, on the relationships, all of that. Mm -hmm. So that's a hard place to be. So but, but what then criteria are restaurants, these grocery chains using to determine where they're going to build these stores? Because I'm not <laughs> seeing the compassion piece built into that if if your goal is truly to meet a need so that that's the piece I, I with. you know the grocery stores look at the bottom line okay what is the bottom line profit yeah and that's what they've looked at we've been fortunate to um to secure the um i guess um the interest of of a uh, gentleman in Churchill who actually we finally, after since 2002, um, mm. we were working to get a grocery store in Churchill. And I, I was city council at that time and was able to get from my city council members to purchase the land where the grocery store is now. Mm -hmm. We had charrettes. That's why I know about the $13.9 million that was going outside the community <laughs> through the feasibility study. But we could not, even after all of that, we could not find a grocery store that felt that the environment that, they, uh, that existed in Churchill would be a benefit to them, would be profitable for them, and so they couldn't, they didn't. And so for the first time, we were able last year to finally get the grocery store there. And even now, the grocery store is struggling. Mm -hmm. um, is it really? So, yeah. So it is, it is wow. you know, they're looking for the bottom line. And so when you had an environment where all they're talking about is violence and Black people and, you know, all of those things that appear to be negative, then these big um, um, companies just refuse to come in to those various communities. Right. Um, and mm -hmm. I'm just hoping that there is a change coming now, um, you know, with the grocery store that is there. Again, they've had some challenge, but that's why I think it's so imperative for government to step in right. and help with the capital right. piece. Right. Um, because a lot of times, because of the community, they cannot be sustained based on just the funds that are coming in through through the community. And that's why, like wow. you said, the government being involved and taking that on is going to be critical. So that yes. they can get the, the um, food that they need. So yeah, okay. Well, the, the government and the community, like yeah. you said, yes. the churches. I mean, you know, and the education piece. That's well, all of it important. Yeah. And I, I don't want us to miss that point that Delegate McQueen made earlier about the role of churches, that we just can't sit yeah. in church. Well, now everything's virtual mostly, but still, you can't just attend and do church as we've done before without making sure that the congregation is aware of issues that the impact social issues. our community. Yeah. Yeah. We, we yeah. should do that. There's no excuse for us not to be educated and for us not to have access 
to uh, to people that represent us to agitate if we were if right we right about right. issues and mm-hmm. so that right. the, the church absolutely plays a critical part in that and well so, the church right. needs to get beyond and i'm saying it as a minister the church mm-hmm. needs to get beyond praying and shouting and and we need to to step in and begin to and there are some who have been very faithful effective and adamant about doing addressing these social issues but all of us um have to get in and begin to address these things you can't pray them away because obviously if you could we wouldn't be talking about them today okay right Right. Right. we've Mm -hmm. got to get in and put our hands to the plow and 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 work to to bring about this change right right absolutely and as a pastor's wife i agree (laughs) (laughs) yeah i tell you that um you have um certainly shared a lot of great great information um with us yeah um both of you we we sincerely thank you for your work and for you just caring enough and not just caring enough, but sitting down and doing the hard work, which is coming up with a plan. People can care, but to actually do the hard work to, to craft a plan of attack and resolution is, um, is impressive. So um, Absolutely. Those, those are really all of the, the questions that we have um, for you today. But again, thank you both. Now, if you, if you have something that you want to share, um, in closing, please, we are all ears. Um, again, thank you very, very much for your, for your hard work. Um, it's impressive, but even more than that, I know that it's going to be successful, that it's going to make a difference. And in, in neighborhoods that oftentimes we don't have a voice, we can't push forward without leadership caring enough to address these issues. So again, our right. thanks. So. I just want to say to you all, thank you both for uh, allowing us and, have, and spending this time, well, for me, spending this time to talk about this particular issue. The only thing that I would say, and, 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 and Chelsea and I've had this conversation, that there is a must that people that look like us get involved in this whole issue of food, desert of food insecurity. So they can sit at the table. And if you're sitting at the table, then you could have some influence. And I just think it's so important that we know and be aware of what's going in our community and then help to bring about resolution. Because I think that a lot of times I can get into the community, you can, uh, because again, of a simulation, those who look like us and they trusting. Yeah. Let's get let's get more involved in these all of these issues. Black farmers, um, you know, uh, 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 entities where you're selling. Let's let's get involved so that we can make a, uh, again bring about the transformation in this particular area. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Chelsea, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? I would say if you are interested in, uh, to any of your listeners, if they're interested in supporting Delegate McQuinn in the Food Access Investment Program and Fund, um, next year she will be looking for additional funding uh, because we want to ensure that there is monies that can be utilized across the state. And while there was 1.25 last year, there's still a greater need, especially yes. as we share it with COVID. And so if you're looking and you want to get involved from a policy advocacy perspective, please reach out. Would love to have you as a part of either our coalition or just someone we can count on to reach out to legislators. Well, thank you. And what we will thank do you. here at Aaron's office when we air this episode, we'll be, in, we'll be sure to include that um, information. We certainly want to support the delegate, need her there need her to continue working on behalf of Virginians. So again, thank you both. Thank you so very much for taking time out of your kudos to you for the great work you do. Absolutely. Have an awesome awesome day. Thank you. Thank you.